Good morning. We start with uh, general questions. And question number one, Ruth Maguire. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it can take to ensure that creditors operating in Scotland are fully briefed on their legal obligations when dealing with clients on a debt arrangement scheme. Just to clarify, that was actually question number two. Question number one was withdrawn. Correct. Question number two, uh, Minister Jamie Hepburn. No, it's not. It's yeah, Minister Jamie Hepburn. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Creditors are fully informed of their statute obligations at each stage of the debt arrangement scheme application and approval process by the accountant in bankruptcy or money advice organisations. The accountant in bankruptcy has a number of stakeholder groups specifically set up to make sure creditors and other interested parties have a proper understanding of debt management and debt relief processes. Ruth Maguire. Thank the Minister for that answer. Debt charity step change have raised some concerns with me around the scheme, one being that there's a widespread misunderstanding of the scheme in the credit industry. What further steps could the Scottish Government take to ensure that creditors operating in Scotland are reminded of their legal responsibilities and obligations regarding the debt arrangement scheme? And would he consider making it a requirement for creditors operating in Scotland to have their staff trained in the debt arrangement scheme? Minister. Well, my first observation, uh, can I thank Ruth Maguire for her question? My first observation, President Officer, would be that the debt arrangement scheme has uh, been a very successful one, and a lot of that is down to the uh, support that is available to uh, creditors and also uh, those having to repay debt uh, set out in my initial uh, answer. Uh, in the, Ruth Maguire mentioned step change. I can say that they are a critical uh, partner in forming our policy. Uh, they also sit on the uh, advisory board uh, of uh, the, uh, the scheme. Uh, they also deliver some elements of the scheme, so we'll always be very uh, willing to hear from them. In relation to the issue of training of uh, staff, um, what I can say is that accountant and bankruptcy staff do visit uh, creditors and provide training when requested. I think it would be beyond the competence of the uh, government uh, to enforce compulsory training on all major financial institutions. Uh, this could uh, potentially be addressed at UK level through the Finan uh, Financial Conduct uh, Authority. Uh, that said, there has been uh, consultation recently on the debt arrangement scheme. Uh, some of the, uh, the issue that was raised by creditors failing to meet their statute obligations of, of the scheme was not highlighted as an issue in uh, the consultation responses uh, received. But, of course, if Step Change or Ruth McGuire want to provide more details of uh, these specific concerns, we will, of course, reflect on uh, such and see if there's more we can do. And a supplementary from Gordon Lindhurst. Mm. Figures from Step Change Scotland just mentioned show that in the Lothian region that I represent, the fastest growing client age category affected in the last three years is the 25 to 39 year old age group. What is the Scottish Government doing at an educational level, particularly within schools, to ensure that young people are taught the basic principles of money management to help avoid them getting into debt in the first place, particularly once they leave school? Minister. Well, of course, uh, a range of uh, matters about trying to inform young people with life skills can be covered uh, in school, and this will be one of the issues that can be uh, taken account of in personal and social uh, education. And if um, Mr Lindhurst wants to write with any specific concerns regarding uh, his region, then, of course, I'll be happy to respond to that. Question number three, Linda Fabiani. <coughs> Government, when it will next meet ScotRail? Minister Hamza Youssef. Ministers and officials regularly meet representatives of ScotRail to discuss a wide range of issues relating to rail services. Uh, I'll be meeting with the managing director uh, later this month. Linda Fabiani. Uh, presiding officer, the minister is, is aware of the many problems we have on the East Kilbride line, which is uh, an extremely busy commuter line from East Kilbride into Glasgow and is only single track, which brings its own issues. However, for months and months now, we have had reduced carriages on that line, resulting in severe overcrowding, and it's becoming more and more difficult for people to have confidence in the rail service from East Kilbride into Glasgow. Can the Minister assure me that he will raise this very seriously with ScotRail at that forthcoming meeting? Minister. Well, I'm disappointed to hear about uh, the problems, uh, though uh, I do use that route uh, myself. Uh, the member will know that uh, that is where my home uh, station is, so I recognise what she says around uh, the need for additional uh, capacity. And she knows that the services, when the top 10 busiest services were published, of course, East Kilbride Services 1701 uh, service uh, from Glasgow in the 1847 
uh, from uh, Glasgow as well were uh, extremely uh, are, are overcrowded. So I can give her uh, an assurance that ScotRail do recognise that. In fact, uh, when it comes to the winter, which I appreciate, of course, is not uh, an immediate solution, but when it comes to the winter, they are looking at additional capacity and additional carriages. What I can also tell the member uh, with a degree of confidence is that when it comes to electric services coming in and the cascading uh, of rolling stock across the network, that East Kilbride uh, is certainly as a priority uh, as ScotRail have told me to increase uh, some of that capacity. In terms of the wider performance of the East Kilbride line, uh, I should say that uh, the performance, the PPM on that line is 95.7, which is above uh, the Scottish average and well above uh, the UK average as well. So performance generally in terms of punctuality is good, but that's notwithstanding uh, the problems, as she says, in around overcrowding, which I will take uh, back to the, the MD of ScotRail when I meet him later this month. Graham Simpson. Thank you. Um, I actually met ScotRail recently and they assured me that uh, that line would be up to uh, full carriage capacity um, over the next few months. Um, but my question is this. Uh, what is required on that line is for the whole of that line to be uh, two, two lines and not for part of it to be one line. And that is what is affecting the capacity. So can the minister tell us what the time scale is for getting that work done and for electrification. Minister. What I would say to the members when it comes to the double tracking uh, via the city deal, uh, as some uh, have mentioned, uh, of course it is of course for, for, for the city deal partners to take that forward and bring that uh, to, to, to the government uh, as part of the city deal uh, package. When it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, additional capacity, on the East Kilbride line, what I will say to the member is that ScotRail are very aware that the East Kilbride line does face those overcrowding issues. Uh, they do see it as a priority in terms, of, uh, in terms of resolving that issue. And I would like to give uh, the member the government's reassurance that we also understand uh, that the overcrowding uh, on the East Kilbride line is, is, is not acceptable. So uh, the reassurances have been given from the, 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 tr the train operator, they've been given by the government, uh, and of course I'm happy to write to the member with more details uh, if he wishes, uh, as, as, as of course electrification uh, comes into service. And Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. When the Minister meets Scott Rail, will he be discussing the repeated incidents of violence at Hamilton Central Station, and will he commit to meeting with the RMT to explore a way forward on this and discuss how to support Scott Rail workers who have been victims of violence? Minister. Uh, can I put on record my appreciation for the work that the member has done in terms of uh, the safety of railway workers? We've met on a, on a number of occasions uh, on this very matter, and it would be remiss of me not to, to put that on record, but also put on record the good campaign that the RMT have run uh, very much on the safety of railway workers. Uh, I will be meeting, in fact, I've got a, a pending invitation to the RMT uh, to meet with me to discuss a range of issues. Uh, and one of the issues that we will be discussing will be the, the Hamilton Central issue, uh, which I know they staged a demonstration at uh, this week. So I'll be happy to meet with uh, uh, RMT on this issue and happy to keep the member updated on that discussion. And question four has been withdrawn. Question five, Gordon MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government how it promotes creative learning among children and young people including encourage their participation in music, dance, film and the arts. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, the Scottish Government promotes creative learning in a wide variety of ways across many portfolios, not just my own. Uh, for example, in education, Curriculum for Excellence recognises the value of creative learning, providing children and young people with opportunities to be creative and imaginative, to experience inspiration and enjoyment and to develop skills for learning, life and work. Our work with young people under the umbrella of Scotland's Youth Arts Strategy, Time to Shine, and supported by initiatives including the Youth Music Initiative, Cashback for Creativity and Systema Scotland is ensuring no young person's background is a barrier to taking part in the arts. And Creative Scotland work in close strategic partnership with Education Scotland, Skills Development Scotland and other key education bodies to deliver Scotland's Creative Learning Plan, which aims to put creativity at the heart of learning in Scotland. And together with Education Scotland, Creative Scotland also continue to support creative learning networks in local authorities across Scotland which deliver so many creative learning opportunities for young people. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I recently attended a Love Music concert at the Usher Hall where 60 young percussionists from Clovenstone and Sighthill Hill Primaries in my constituency performed with professional musicians. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that in Edinburgh over 24,000 young people participated in music, creative and cultural activities in the last academic year. 
Will she join me in commending the arts and creative learning team at the City of Edinburgh Council for providing Scotland's largest instrumental music service and youth music initiative programme at no cost to children and young people? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I'm more than happy to congratulate Edinburgh uh, and what it does in terms of cultural experience participation, uh, but also on, on creative learning and their reach uh, is very extensive and the value of that is immensely important. And can I also congratulate Cloverstone Primary and the percussionists there and also recognise, I think, across Scotland, the appreciation that schools and councils have for the support they receive from MSPs from across the chamber in the cultural life of Scotland and particularly our young people. And I would encourage all members in the Chamber to continue to support um, their local cultural activity as uh, Gordon MacDonald has done here in Edinburgh. Question number six, Alex Cole hamilton Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last discussed policing in Edinburgh with Police Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. I meet with the Chief Constable regularly to discuss issues concerning the policing of Scotland and Scottish Government officials liaise regularly with Police Scotland colleagues about a range of issues. However, decisions about day-to-day -day policing in Edinburgh are a matter for the Police Scotland Divisional Commander of Edinburgh and for the Chief Constable. Alex Cole Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Edinburgh Evening News reported on Monday that detection rates in the capital have fallen to just 35.4%, the lowest in the country. It reveals that the toughest cases to crack are those around housebreaking and vandalism, both of which are particularly prevalent in my constituency of Edinburgh Western. Such detection issues have been a concern since the formation of Police Scotland and a time period which has also been met with a demonstrable drop in police morale. What steps does the Cabinet Secretary and his government intend to take with Police Scotland to address this? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm saying, I know that Police Scotland are committed to taking a robust approach to tackling all these forms of crime and have got a range of measures which are taking forward within Edinburgh specifically to tackle issues relating to housebreakings, which I know they have an operation ongoing to tackle, and also that they intend to take forward further work relating to the theft of motorcycles uh, in the Edinburgh area over the course of this weekend bringing in significant both regional and national resource to support that, which is one of the key benefits we have in having a national police force and be able to deploy resources from a national level into supporting uh, local operations. But it is also worth keeping in mind that nationally, uh, our most recent recorded crime stats show that policing clear-up rates are at their highest for 40 years. I recognise that there may be particular issues in given locations uh, and Police Scotland are taking forward appropriate measures in order to tackle those. And I would continue to encourage members, such as the member, to engage with local commanders where they have specific concerns about local policing issues. Gordon MacDonald. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that Police in Edinburgh Division, as well as the 12 other police divisions in Scotland and the communities which they serve, would benefit greatly if the UK Government treated Police Scotland fairly and allowed them to claim back the £35 million a year in VAT in the same way they allowed police forces across the rest of the UK, academy schools and Highways England to claim back their VAT? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, as I've uh, made very clear in this chamber on a number of occasions, is that the way in which Police Scotland and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service have been treated by the UK Government on the ability to reclaim that is simply unacceptable. Where it has chosen to, the UK Government have been prepared to allow other national organisations to reclaim that. Why they've chosen not to allow Police Scotland and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service to do so is beyond me. So, officer, I can only hope that with the increasing number of Conservative MPs that they now have from Scotland in Westminster, that they will show some backbone and stand up for our police service here in Scotland and stand up for our fire service rather than accepting the discrimination against our services here in Scotland. Question number seven, Ash Denham. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on setting a cap on mid market rents in order to possibly achieve more affordable housing. Minister Kevin Stewart. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government wishes, wishes to ensure that mid-market rent levels remain affordable to households on low to modest incomes. And that is why landlords that have received Scottish Government support in recent years, whether in the form of grant funding, loan finance or financial guarantees, are not permitted to set rents above the midpoint of the local private sector rent levels. 
which are generally based on broad rental market area dated data collected and published by the Scottish Government. Ash Denham. I thank the Minister for that answer. Would the Minister be able to advise how many more mid-market properties are to be built in Edinburgh over the next four years? Minister. Uh, President officer, there will be uh, a significant levels of MMR properties delivered across Edinburgh to meet the high demand for good quality affordable housing. Uh, based on the Strategic Housing Investment Plan approvals for Edinburgh, we expect to see around 2,100 MMR properties built over the next four years, supported, of course, by Scottish Government funding. Uh, beyond that, we will see uh, Scottish Government investment of £29.115 million this year uh, from the uh, Affordable Housing Supply Programme here in the capital city. Uh, and I was pleased the other week uh, to announce £1.745 billion pounds of resource planning assumptions uh, for the next three years, which will give certainty to local authorities across Scotland uh, in terms of delivering our, our affordable housing programme. Uh, and that will see investment, uh, a minimum investment of £124.5 million pounds here in Edinburgh. Yeah, yeah. Question number eight, James Kelly. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure that bus fare rates in Glasgow are affordable. Minister Hamza Yusuf. The Scottish Government supports bus services across Scotland, including Glasgow, through the bus service operators Grant BSOG, the budget of which is currently 53.5 million for 2017-18. Uh, the aim of this bus subsidy is to keep fares at an affordable level and enable bus operators to run services that might not otherwise be commercially viable, helping to support uh, the national bus network. James Kelly. Uh, thank the Minister uh, for that answer. Uh, car ownership rates uh, are lower in Glasgow than in any other area of the country. Therefore, uh, bus travel is essential to many in the city. And it's therefore deeply regrettable that in the recent spate of uh, fare rises, some of the, the rises imposed the first bus and, and some of the fares uh, were in excess of 10%. Uh, as the Transport Minister and also as a Glasgow MSP, can the Minister explain why the government of which he is a member is in favour of reducing prices for air travellers, yet uh, bus passengers in Glasgow see hikes in, in greater than inflation? Right. Minister. Can I try to take this, uh, a, a, a consensual approach to this? Because I know that the member as much as I would like to see, of course, more people on public transport. And in terms of the issue around congestion uh, around Glasgow and the west of Scotland, congestion, of course, is one of the biggest uh, issues. Uh, when it comes to bus patronage, uh, I would just like to gently remind them that the steepest decline in bus patronage across Scotland has been in Glasgow and the west, of course, where Labour councils have been in control, not for years, uh, but for decades. But notwithstanding, notwithstanding that, when it comes to buses, we are bringing forward a transport bill. That transport bill, of course, will have a bus element to it. And part of the, a suite of measures are being brought forward in that transport bill, in the bus element of that, such as local franchising, potentially, which we'll consult on, issues of municipal bus ownership as well, uh, issues of tackling congestion, increasing smart ticket uh, uh, smart tickets as well, availability as well. So all of this, this suite of measures should help to increase patronage. But of course, when I meet with First Bus next, I will raise the issue uh, that the member raises with me around bus fares in Glasgow and the West. And I will just end on this point that bus fare rises, as unwelcome as they are, of course, are lowest in Scotland than they are anywhere else in the UK. Mike Rumbles. Does the minister accept that free bus travel for the over 60s is a win-win, not only for the individuals, a concern, but for reducing congestion and on our roads, and a win particularly for our environment. Yes, sir. Well, we of course have funded free bus travel in the National Concessionary Travel Scheme uh, for a number of years now, and what we've committed to in our manifesto is, in fact, to extend it to modern apprentices and potentially young people on a jobs grant. Uh, we do have to look at the sustainability of that. I think that is important. I think people recognise. Uh, that, but we won't do any changes and make any changes to the National Concessionary Travel Scheme without consulting on, on that. Jamie Green. Will the Minister agree with me that local authorities should have an enabling power over bus franchising made available to them? Minister. 
I know that uh, that has been brought forward as part of the UK bus services bill and as I mentioned in my answer to James Kelly, uh, when we bring forward a transport bill, it will have a bus element to it. Uh, one of the, uh, certainly the, the, the powers or measures that we will look to explore and that we will look to consult on uh, would be local franchising.